One of the most interesting and important events in the evolution of life on Earth involves the development of the first eukaryotic cells. It involves this process called endosymbiosis. Let's take a look at what it's all about. Firstly, let's take a look at a definition of this term endosymbiosis. It refers to an association in which one cell lives inside another and they both benefit. Now, to help you remember the definition, there's actually some clues in the term endosymbiosis. For starters, the term endo helps us remember that it's where one cell lives inside another. And the term symbiosis helps us to remember that it's where they both benefit. So the idea that one cell lives inside another, endo helps us remember that because the way that one cell has got inside of the other cell is through endocytosis. And hopefully you remember the process of endocytosis where large particles, even entire cells like in this scenario, can enter another cell. If you're not familiar with endocytosis, then check out the video that I've made on that before. Uh, the process, of course, in this case is for the larger things, and so it's phagocytosis, which is one of the two types of endocytosis. So the endo part helps us remember that's how one cell got inside of the other. The symbiosis part is the part that helps us remember that it's a way that they both benefit. One cell has gone inside of the other and somehow they're both benefiting from each other. That's essentially what symbiosis means. It's a relationship between two organisms of different species where they both benefit. I might just bring in a couple of examples here to show you what I'm talking about. One is the relationship between a buffalo and a cattle egret. You often see them living together in this way. They both benefit because the buffalo stirs up some insects around the grass as it's moving around. And also there are some bugs and insects living on the buffalo's body and the egret can eat both of those. But also the buffalo can benefit because those bugs and insects that live on its body are often quite annoying and the egret is getting rid of those. Another example of symbiosis is one that you would have seen before, I'm sure, Nemo here. The clownfish and the sea anemone. The clownfish benefits because it gets access to food that's forming on the sea anemone and it also gets a safe haven. The sea anemone benefits because the clownfish eats leftover parts of fish and algae that's forming on the anemone. So hopefully that helps you know and understand the term endosymbiosis and what it means. But how does this apply to eukaryotic cells? Well, the first ever eukaryotic cells are thought to have formed through endosymbiotic events. Remember that back before our eukaryotic cells, the Earth was only populated by prokaryotic cells, very simple cells similar to the bacterial cells that we see today. So the theory is that some of the larger prokaryotic cells began to engulf some of the smaller prokaryotic cells. And so that's what you can see in this diagram here, a large cell engulfing some smaller cells through that process of endocytosis, specifically phagocytosis. Then after those cells have been engulfed, some of those smaller prokaryotic cells that were engulfed may have possessed the ability to carry out photosynthesis. Or some of the smaller cells that were engulfed may have possessed the ability to carry out aerobic respiration. And this is thought to be a possible origin of the chloroplasts, which we see today, and the mitochondria. So obviously the reason for the term endosymbiosis being used here, these have entered the cell via a process like endocytosis. And symbiosis, because it's a benefit for this large cell 
to now have cells within it that can carry out something like photosynthesis because they can provide the large cell with glucose and oxygen. And it's a benefit for the cell to contain cells like these because they can carry out aerobic respiration which can break down glucose using oxygen to provide energy for the cell. It's a benefit for these cells that have come into the large cell because now living within a larger cell they've got increased protection living within a larger cell and possibly access to increased amounts of nutrients that they require. Now as I said this is a theory it's a very popular theory and hopefully if you're getting used to science by now you'll be asking the question what is the evidence? What's the evidence that this process and these endosymbiotic events are what led to the chloroplasts and the mitochondria that we see today and the eukaryotic cells that we see today? There's some really strong evidence for this endosymbiosis. In fact, there's four main pieces of evidence and it, they apply when we look closely at the chloroplast and the mitochondria in today's eukaryotic cells. Firstly, mitochondria and chloroplasts both have their own DNA. Not just that, but the DNA that we find inside of the chloroplast and the mitochondria is circular, like prokaryotic cells, and not linear, like eukaryotic cells. Also, the DNA that we see inside the chloroplast and the mitochondria does not contain proteins like the DNA inside of eukaryotic cells. Another piece of evidence is that chloroplasts and mitochondria have their own ribosomes. You can see the ribosomes here in the chloroplast and the ribosomes here in the mitochondria. Those ribosomes inside of chloroplasts and mitochondria are more similar to prokaryotic ribosomes than to eukaryotic ribosomes. They look more like the ones that we have inside of bacterial cells today than inside of other cells. The third piece of evidence for endosymbiosis is that chloroplasts and mitochondria can both self-replicate. And they self-replicate by dividing in a process that kind of looks like a cell division. And if we think about the DNA that's inside of them, it's circular, not linear. Therefore, the process by which they divide is actually more similar to binary fission than it is to the mitotic cell division that we see in eukaryotic cells. The fourth and final piece of evidence for endosymbiosis is that both the chloroplast and the mitochondria have two membranes. They have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. The thing about them is the outer membrane is similar to the eukaryotic cell membrane that we see today. But the inner membrane is more similar to prokaryotic cell membrane. And if you think about the idea of endosymbiotic events, that can help you see what might have caused that. Let me just bring back our diagram of the endosymbiotic event. So through phagocytosis, a type of endocytosis, a smaller cell was engulfed by a larger cell. Now when that larger cell engulfs the smaller cell, it wraps its own membrane around the smaller cell. Therefore, that outer membrane is going to be similar to the membrane of the larger cell. The inner membrane was the membrane of the original cell that was engulfed. And so that inner membrane is going to be more similar to the original cell. So that's why this is a piece of evidence for endosymbiosis, that the outer membrane of chloroplasts and mitochondria is similar to a eukaryotic cell membrane, but their inner membrane, the folded one for mitochondria, or the inner membrane for chloroplasts, is more similar to a prokaryotic cell membrane. So there you go, an explanation of endosymbiosis and how and why it is thought to have led to the eukaryotic cells that we see today. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you next time.